Let's time travel for a moment, shall we? The year is 2014. Titanfall 1 is out and EA definitely won't ruin that franchise. Amazon just bought Twitch for a bill and I just bought myself groceries for the first time as a 21 year old. I was kind of making moves. It was the rise of Chris Pratt. Dark Souls is back and it still hates you. Ellen takes a selfie and she seems like such a nice person. My name is Jeff defeats comedy forever and FNAF 1 the video game creates both horror and furries. We're almost there, stay with me. Jimmy Fallon starts hosting The Tonight Show and his laugh brings people Peace to the world. Chris Evans is back and he's still hot. Watch underscore dogs is not Assassin's Creed and out comes that depressing space film as my wife likes to call it. Also Destiny 1 came out. It's like Halo but with more guns and abilities and less everything else. Hi my name's Jez. Destiny 1's campaign was absurd and this is a green screen rant. On the Disney Channel our story begins with pick your flavor. Would you like to punch guys all the time? Spam jump all the time? Or jump fail all the time? No matter what this aesthetic will be bulky, this will be edgy and this will be dainty. Basically you've got Master Chief, Shadow the Hedgehog, or Princess Peach. But just like eating ice cream, any flavor is a win except Titan. And it's time for cutscene number one on planet Mars present day. I believe this is Elon, Bezos, and that Indian guy from every Twitter meme. They stumble onwards until mysterious floating orb straight from your local ping pong table. But it's magical and stuff. Ooh, it's so it's so spherical you won't even believe it. How, how round and spherical. Destiny title screen, rights reserved. I'm pretty sure that's a little guy doing this. But for real, there's no way they don't explain the main logo, right? We still don't know nine years later. Here's what we do know. We know it's called the Tricorn. It was hidden in the footprint of the trailer we just saw. It's also the footprint of a fallen walker in game. The limbs might represent the three classes or the three original elements or a fire team of three surrounding the traveler. It could be a wolf face or Master Chief's cock and balls. The speaker wears it on his chest, but good luck getting an explanation out of that mentally absent candle. Almost a decade later, all we have is a name and some random and unadulterated guesswork. And if you leave a comment trying to explain, you're a know-it-all and everyone hates you. Nobody fact checks me but me and my source is myself. Checkmate atheist. We transition to a 2D star map explainer video because the previous Mars cutscene looks like it was made in Unreal Engine 15 by the AI that inevitably enslaves humanity. And that is an unsustainable level of quality. So no problems for me there. Bill Nye tells us that the beach ball is the traveler, which helped us put cities on Mars, Venus, Mercury, Uranus, my anus, everybody's anus got a city. Human lifespan tripled thanks to the Trav. Except in America, theirs decreased slightly, which is kind of ironic and would never happen in real life. Circular God had an enemy though, a vague hentai snake that chased it across the galaxy. This darkness has pursued Golf Ball Daddy for, and I quote, eons and I unquote. Which had hunted it for eons. Let me stop you right there, Bill, if that is your real name. How do you know Big Ball been chased eons? Did the eternally silent egg whisper sweetly in your ear? Cause I doubt it. Its main thing is that it doesn't speak. Shut up me, it's time for mission one. Cosmodrome, Old Rosia. A stunning sunrise over a snowy vista. Generations of Mater from Disney Pixar lay dead across the plains. A Rubik's cube with a flashlight and a dream is searching while unknown space pirates follow. Probably the world's second weakest fire team, surpassed by myself and my two parental friends. Hooray, first person activated. The ghostly CPR worked and we are immortal guardians now. Much like every person ever born, consent to being a conscious life form was simply not required. One day I'll die, but if it weren't for my parents, I never would have lived. So you could say my death will be entirely my parents' fault. I can't believe you've done this, you fornicating murderous goblins. This just in, mum and dad kill every person who's ever lived. I've ever done the parent thing, haven't I? According to the scope in we just saw from the captain like nine seconds ago, they should be literally so close, like a stone throw away, like right over there. But alas, they are nowhere to be seen. And that's fine. As my grandma used to say, why do continuity when grandma used to say? We head inside and our ghost says this. Hang tight. Fall and thrive in the dark. We won't. Much like Robert Pat wearing eye makeup, the fallen thrive in darkness. Interesting is what I would have said if this fact was ever mentioned or expanded upon even once over the next nine years. The law nerds may try and refute that point in the comments, but just know I'm right. We find a gun immediately, and I believe Kvostov is Russian for let's shoot that guy over there. We make our way through the wall and circling back to my question from earlier, if the fallen do thrive in the dark, why are they mostly in well-lit areas. We find an old ship made of rust and LED lights and fire it up instantly with some unspecified space magic. How vague and effective. Team Rocket's blasting off again and right as we leave, look who comes crawling out of the concrete clitoris. I mean, you tell me, I don't know that guy. The camera pans up to reveal a mysterious stranger with a rifle watching us from afar. I wonder what they'll call her. 
Oh. Interrupting Money Boy here with a realistic lower half. Have you heard of this plate? Are you saying this plate? No, this plate. Hey, it's more than just a metal poster. It's beauty in a world of ugly. It's a big dick on a short man. And this is me unboxing my latest Destiny theme plates. Look at me. I've never been happier. Could a sad boy peel the plastic off like that? Actually, I really struggled to get the effing plastic off. It was like a full-blown bank heist trying to unwrap it. Aren't you sick of looking at a blank wall in your own place that you are? Isn't your life boring enough as it is? I too was a dreary little creature until this plate changed everything. Now I'm creative, hydrated, and exercising three to four times per week. All right, try and follow this. Step one, magnet. Step two, poster. Are you still with me? Because that's, that's it. It's everything you love with a matte or gloss finish. Right there. As a little treat for your own eyes. It's more than just colors on metal. It's a tiny slice of heaven in your back pocket. And if you don't believe in heaven, ignore that last one. So click my link or use my gluten-free promo code JEZ to get 22% or 33% off for Christmas. Or adjacent holiday. Sponsored by Display, my nipples are hard. Welcome to the tallest building at the last safe city on earth. The tower. Now Simba, everything that twinkles is our responsibility. Can we go down there? No, no. Dear God, no. That's where the commons live. In a few years, when the sequel comes out, we can visit several streets at best. Until then, we have the last city at home. Upon arrival, the ghost says this. And this tower is where the guardians live. Okay, cool. Where's my room? Because as far as I can tell, Tanix has no house. We're off to find a warp drive for our ship. Welcome to the Cosmodrome for real this time, comrade. The Sea Drome was actually based on a real life place in Kazakhstan. That means one of the guardians out there is this guy. What type of dog is this? This is a tortoise. Is this a cat in a hat? No, no it's a tortoise in a shell. Yes. God bless Central Asia. Our ghost hits us with some fresh intel. A guardian ship was recently shot down here. Oh, you mean this ship? Does this look recently deceased to you? Or is every microfiber rusted to oblivion? We check this map downstairs and wouldn't you know, the warp drive is exactly where we found our ship last mission. Back we go, I guess. Kill the big daddy. Hard drive acquired. Then our ghost makes this declaration. This could cripple the fallen. So we killed one restaurant manager level fallen and our ghost thinks this might just cripple their entire race? Hey Dinklebot, I don't want to overstep here, but gun to my head? No, that's wrong. And dumb and wrong. Maybe I'm just a hater, but the pirates that have infiltrated most of our solar system can probably afford to lose one guy. But hey, I was dead in a Russian taxi like 20 minutes ago. The military industrial complex of an alien species might be above me. We need to go see the speaker. Yeah, we need to go see the speaker and tell him absolute victory is imminent. We literally killed one guy. Their race is collapsing. It's so obvious. Anyway, we only say four words to the speaker and they're completely unrelated. What can I do? Backing up a few minutes, the speaker opens with this line. There was a time when we were much more powerful. But guardians are a bunch of magic wielding undead immortal gods. So how much more powerful were we really? Like, did we also do a mean roast turkey in the kitchen? Ooh. The darkness is coming back. We will not survive it this time. Could we maybe put someone who hasn't completely given up in charge? Isn't the bare minimum required of any leader to think we could win? Now we're off to Skywatch, aka Big Room with Big Dish. This is where we meet the Hive for the first time. You remember the Flood from high school? The Pods are now Thrall, the Carriers are now Kurtz Thrall, the Marines are now Acolytes, the Rangers are now Shriekers, the Brutes are now Knights, the Tanks are now Ogres, and the Swarmers are now Wizards. Are they carbon copies? No. Are they intellectually adjacent? Also no. I'm kidding, of course they are. We kill a red bar wizard in the next room and that's the climax of the mish. Red bar is the lowest of all bars, so not a lot of meat on these starving bones. Now we go to the forgotten shore because the fallen are looking for something and ghost doesn't like that. He wants it first and he doesn't know what it is. We hop on our sparrow for some real pod racing hours. I didn't realize how far ahead of its time a ground vehicle could be until nine years later Starfield said we don't have those. Enjoy going slow you fat little bitch. Thank you Todd, what a great choice. The fallen are trying to hack these machines, but something is playing an Uno reverse card. It turns out Windows Defender is alive and well in the Cosmodrome after all these years. Billy G, you old cockroach. No, it's actually an AI that was built to defend Earth and somehow survived the collapse. He speaks with a Russian accent and his name is Putin. Rasputin. He's an apex predator military intelligence whose nickname is The Tyrant and is vaguely Russian. Buzzfeed's top 10 Simpsons moments that actually came true. A team of guardians recently went dark, so we're back on the yellow brick road to find out what that F is up. That's right, it's me Dorothy back on my grind set. We find a couple of dead ghosts that still hold the codes TM. We put those into this computer because F you, that's why. An old giga satellite rises from the ashes as we get attacked by the hive. Turns out this array is controlled 
controlled by Vladimir P. And now that it's been rebooted, has connected to defense systems across space. That's probably good and will hypothetically help us in the future. Okay, that's it for the Earth missions. Off to the gray ball. No, the other gray ball. So after the collapse, humanity gave up the moon to keep the hive away from Earth. Now the hive have both. So task failed successfully. We know there's a big hive fortress somewhere and the last guy who came looking for the entrance disappeared and not in the David Blaine kind of way. I'm sure he's fine, but let's take every gun we have and load them with killing bits that kill as a peace offering. The coordinates lead us to the dead guardian's diary. Peeping his notes like a horny little teenager, it appears he was obsessed with a place called the Temple of Crota. That's this place. And here's the dead guy. Upon on inspection, there's nothing left, not even the light. His soul was sucked straight out of his body like a Dementor going rogue from Azkaban. From afar, the mysterious stranger with a rifle watches us, offering no help whatsoever. Kind of like a father who's mentally checked out because their teenage son is into video games. And it's just too hard to pretend he's interested. The impenetrable fortress door unlocks, and we didn't even have to knock. That is extremely convenient, because we had literally no way of getting in. You could say that we've woken the hive. We've woken the hive. A tsunami of brain dead parasites floods out. But that's that's okay because I was a BDP living at home for the first 21 years of my life. After killing all the things, Ghost says this. I'm picking up the dying light of a ghost inside. Quickly, within 12 seconds, we find that ghost. And wouldn't you know, we were too late. 12 seconds can make a much bigger difference than you think. Just ask my pregnant wife. Making a baby is one squirt of mayonnaise left for nine months in a fan-forced oven. It should be way harder than that. Also, my wife's not actually pregnant, praise Gabe Newell. He is though, so congratulations. According to the dead ghost's memories, the hive are raising an army here to invade Earth. Uh, even more than they already have, because they're kind of all over it right now. Now, the Hive also have a secret diary where they wrote everything they know about Earth. Dear Diary, humans are kind of cute, ooh-woo. Wow, that's so true, woo. And we're off to suck those knowledge titties like Ty Lopez straight out of his garage. Problem, there's an ancient knight who protects the diary, whose name, I believe, and it's hard to translate, so this is only approximate, is Greg from your local Starbucks. Naturally, we kill him giga dead murder head. And he drops something labeled key to the world's grave. That is very specific and exactly what we're after. Then the ghost says this. This should lead us right to the grave. The world's grave, not ours. Oh, a joke? In this economy? I wouldn't risk it personally. Now this is either a demonic summoning circle or a peaceful protest to raise a minimum wage. Either way, it's our moral duty to shoot first and learn the native hive tongue to double check later. The point is, we are the good guys and democracy isn't gonna spread itself. So Ghost starts to read the hive diary, which is a vague pillar that may be digital or a slab of rock. They don't strike me as a Nintendo DS wielding society, but Nintendogs comes for us all in the end. Eventually Ghost says this. Here's so much it broken the Beckenstein limit. Fun fact time. So the Beckenstein limit is actually an upper limit on the thermodynamic. I'm a little pussy boy who wets himself at night. Eventually, Dinklebot has read all the things. And here's where we're at. Okay, I've got it all. There is unbelievable stuff in here. The Hive have seen thousands of worlds taken by the darkness. And they've been seeding Earth for centuries waiting for their gods to return. I don't know what it is about PD's voice acting in this game, but it's just not good IMO. It feels like his entire emotional range is between a 3.5 and a 4 out of 10. Him saying there is unbelievable stuff in here is the most emphasis he's had all game. It just kind of sounds like he read every single line riddled with Botox, so he couldn't move his face to express a single emotion. And as someone who feels several feeling per year, I specialize in lacking emotion. Now, when the Hive originally conquered the moon, they used an atomic bomb called the Sword of Crota. Much like real life, escalating warfare to the nuke level sucks for everyone. We gotta go Tom Cruise defuse that bad boy so it's never used again. To do that, we have to kill the four atomic bomb creators, the Swarm Princes. That's like saying killing Oppenheimer will definitely stop the Trinity test. Maybe. Or maybe I'll suck my own dick because there's no hope for anyone if that's the plan. It's Sword Daddy number one. You're not my prince because you're mm, my dad. In transit to the rest of the family, our ghost says this. Not to unsettle you, but I'm tracking the sword by the light of the guardians it's killed. Ah oh yes, this trail of dead bodies that led us right to the murderer was certainly helpful. Sherlock won't believe we cracked this one without him. As we push deeper into the hive building, after killing one red bar wizard and a couple of dinky thralls, the sword is just here, like sitting right here. The most powerful weapon the Hive have ever used against us. Imagine if Luke Skywalker was handed the keys to the Death Star after killing two guys. That's what this is. Listen to our tower's loot goblin describe this sword on the way in. Long ago, the moon fell to Crota. He wielded a sword so dark it drained whatever light it touched. Now Crota sleeps 
but the sword does not. A sword so dark, it drained whatever light it touched. Well, that sounds sick, but like, is this it? Can I get a bit more darkness with my planet conquering mega evil darkness sword? It's not even slightly black, you know, the color of night, not that one. It's just the generic nondescript hive moon texture. The game launched with this exotic hand cannon. That looks pretty dark and cool and evil. Just make it longer. Game design, it's just that easy, I'm pretty sure. Okay, one more thing on the sword, then I'll move on. The princes have almost identical, yet somehow slightly cooler looking swords because theirs have a subtle green glow. Ooh. Everyone knows red and green are the two colors of evil because anger, blood, danger, and poison, sickness. Yucky. Shout out to Bangladesh, those guys are hardcore. Speaking of the Half-Blood Prince, where were you, my guy? I already have the sword, and now you're waking up to do something about it? There wasn't even a single locked door on the way in to grab it. All good, we kill him and his two brothers, who only attack one at a time. Questionable military tactics at best. Are we sure if we just let the Hive invade Earth, they won't just open a chain of Walmarts or something? I'm just not seeing the danger. After killing the final Prince of Persia, the sword despawns, and... I lied, I do have one more thing to say about this. Remember that the sword is, quote, so dark it drains whatever light it touches? We are guardians of the light, so I guess as long as we're wearing gloves, it's safe to hold? If a thin layer of rubber is enough to stop the Giga Sword, isn't it more of a flaccid ween at best? Why even bother to destroy it? Let's throw a condom on there and just call it a day. Let's just move on, shall we, to this urgent transmission from the Speaky Weaky. Nothing is more important now. We believe the Hive are engaged in a ritual that is draining the Traveler of its light. Whatever power they wield must be understood. A ball being drained against its will is a capital C crime in my book. The ghost hits us with some cold water. This ritual could be happening in any one of their thousands of chambers. Okay, a thousand is a lot of anything. Unless the government keeps printing money, in which case it'll be one banana. But a thousand chambers is a lot. So this is probably gonna take quite some time. We found it immediately. Back to the Temple of Time and let's do a cutscene in the same spot as a few missions ago. Why film new scene where old scene do trick? You're interesting. Not entirely interesting, but you have promise. I know what you're about to do. It's brave. We finally hear from the sexy stranger. She negs us with an inverse compliment and is definitely trying to pick us up. Pretty obvious. And if you think that's gonna work on me, it did and I'll do anything for you. I will say her voice hit me like a musical waterfall from heaven. It is so much more animated than Peter D. Parker. He's been playing one note on the piano this whole time. And then she's like, anyway, here's Wonderwall. So you know the whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus expression? Unrelated to that, she's calling from Venus. So we gotta go there next. Go down and face the hive. And if you live, come find me. Great. What do we do now? We go down. Instructions unclear. Do we have oral sex or not? I only just noticed that the Guardian says we go down because she says you should go down. We are simping for the first robot mummy that noticed us, which leads me to believe that before resurrection, our Guardian was an incel. Or it's just bad writing. It could be either. A few rooms later, we arrive at the place. Here it is. The darkest of all the Hive's chambers. Yeah, but seems pretty well lit to me. This buffalo wild wing is a shard of the Traveler. The Hive are using it to suck light from the rest of its body. I guess it's still attached somehow? Um, metaphysics, you wouldn't understand. We kill some enemies, including this angry ogie wogie and set the appendage free to reintegrate with its natural habitat. Or it just went to spherical heaven, along with every tennis ball you lost as a child. To the jungles of Venus we go, because a hot chick stalked us, and threw out some pretty good neg bait on a phone call. And if you don't know what a neg is, don't look it up. And also, I'm proud of you. Welcome to the shattered coast, Ishtar Sank. Hey mom, can we go to the ruined city in Inception? No, we have the ruined city at home. But you really was inspired by Inception's crumbling cityscape when making this. And I think that's cool. Almost as cool as Leo refusing to date a woman above 25. Look at all these women. You think he accidentally breaks up with them as soon as they turn 25? Hmm. And I accidentally set Datto's cosplay pics as my desktop wallpaper. The point is, a 50 year old man and a 20 year old woman together is fine. And my eyebrows aren't even slightly raised. We head to an old guardian outpost and Dinka explains a bit more about what's going on. There's a lot here about some war machines called the Vex. Indestructible, relentless, supremely intelligent and they can teleport. Great. A new challenger approaches. For those keeping track at home, we've got pirates, insects, and now robots trying to kill humanity. So they're indestructible, relentless, and supremely intelligent. If it isn't me trying to describe myself in three words or less. Now my only problem with the word indestructible is this, and this, and this. Additional follow-up, uh, supremely intelligent, question mark?
Look, descriptions are tricky because words have meaning. So when you label something indestructible and supremely intelligent, I gotta see some pudding in that proof. The strangest coordinates lead us inside the Ishatar Academy and it's combat time. Can I interest you in a shoot multiple guy? You son of a vex, I'm in. We kill easily a hundred women and children, but don't worry, they started it. Now strap yourself in for the pinnacle of video game cinema. Well fought. You're here. We haven't got much time. Who are you? Why have you been watching us? I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. The most viral thing to come out of Destiny 1. A hemorrhoid sentence explaining about not explaining, and then later refusing to explain. That was D1's legacy captured in 53 characters or less. Then she says this. I will. I will. I know. Will what? I wasn't talking to you, little light. I'm a ghost, actually. Ooh, someone's a bit sensitive, aren't they? You're gonna cry? You're gonna piss your pants, you little Bluetooth speaker? The stranger doesn't even acknowledge that she upset him. What a bad bitch. But who's she talking to? Many guardians fell. Strong ones. But you made it here. Yes, I'm listening. They are here. With me. Who's she talking to? Understood. You need my help, Guardian. She swats him away like a fly. Absolutely KO'd, 1v1, final destination, no items. God, I'm rock hard. But for real, who is she talking to? You know what's crazy is that Bungie themselves didn't even know at the time. Most likely. Here's an interview with Destiny 2's game director, Luke Smith, three years after D1 came out. Is it because none of you have any idea what the darkness actually means? Question mark. Candidly, we had no idea what it was. Straight up. We lumped all the races in together as minions of the darkness, but that's not what the IP deserves. So Guardian, Light, Good, and Alien, Dark, bad. You could replace every cutscene with caveman hieroglyphics and have a better understanding of what's going on. Basically what Luke Smith is saying in that interview, is that they vibed the whole story. We have two compelling sources that reinforce this. The first is an article called The Messy True Story Behind the Making of Destiny, where Jason Trier spoke to six Bungie employees who worked on the game. The second is Marty O'Donnell's public lawsuit against Bungie. He sued them on the grounds of wrongful termination and won. This is a short tale I wrote called Why Destiny's Campaign Sucked Major Donkey Balls. Grab a stopwatch and a napkin, it's gonna be quick and juicy. So Bungie made D1 in approximately four years. How many of those do you think they spent on the campaign? Kind of all four because game development is broad and interconnected, but also kind of it was less than one. So after a few years of work, the writers had put together a two hour supercut of the game's cinematics and major story beats. Around July 2013, they showed it to the big dogs at senior leadership. And uh oh, the doggies hated it. Too campy and linear, sources say. So they blue screened that version out of existence and started from scratch. Let's call that event something catchy, like the collapse. It's probably fine though, right? I mean, how long until the game is supposed to come out? Oh, you know, one month, maybe a month and a half. Obviously that couldn't happen now that a tactical nuke had been dropped on the campaign story. So Bungie pushed the internal release date back another six months to March, 2014. After the collapse incident, the top dog spent a few weeks uh, substantially revising the story according to the O'Donnell lawsuit. Basically deleting plot threads, overhauling characters and rewriting most of the dialogue. They cut apart each story and mission, splicing together encounters from various places to form the Franken meme that was Destiny's new campaign. They basically had to cobble together, restitch, and reuse things already built for a designer suit, and instead make it work for generic Disney merch. The former is expensive, but specific and prioritized. The latter is shallow, uninspired, and overconsumed. So things are melting down behind the scenes, and the six-month release extension was not enough. Upper management had to go through the lengthy and complicated process of begging Activision for another delay. After some FBI hostage negotiation, they secured a ship date of September 2014, a mere one year after the internal story collapse incident. And as we know from history, D1 was released to the gaming public on September 9th, 2014, just as Daddy Activision required. So the point is, all the dialogue we got in game was the rewritten stuff. Back to Venus and the worst cutscene ever though. It's just crazy that the vague riddles of D1's plot were unknown even to the developers. If that isn't the most hardcore mystery ever devised, even the authors are like, IDK. Then Ghost hits the stranger with this accusation. You're not a guardian. No. I was not forged in light. That is some strong show me your birth certificate energy and that deserves a smack on the bottom. She goes, yeah, I was born somewhere else, dude. How is that even relevant? Obviously the dink is mad and lashing out. Then there's this cringe moment. But I believe where our paths cross, ground could break. 
Did you really have to cut away to a different camera angle as she burst the little tum-tum? We just killed 55 goblins in this room. It wasn't too violent then. Is this game rated T for teen or LB for little bitch? Kids on TikTok these days are drinking industrial grade laundry detergent while dancing to Taylor Swift. You think they can't handle a little milky splod? Also, I don't, I mean, I, I don't have TikTok, but I just, I assume that's what they're doing there. Then she tells us to find the black garden and rip out its heart. Save the cheerleader, save the world. Ghost says to find the black garden, we have to visit the Awoken. This triggers the stranger into piping up with an audible fortune cookie. Ah, yes, the Awoken. Out there wavering between the light and the dark. A side should always be taken, little light. Even if it's the wrong side. There is so much to unpack here. If it isn't, I'm 14 and this is very deep. A side should always be taken, even if it's the wrong side. Somebody wrote that dialogue and went, I've done it. I am Marcus Aurelius. But let's explore that advice for a moment, shall we? Mum and dad are getting a divorce and I'd like to stay close to both? Wrong. It's one or the other. There are so many stocks to choose from. I think I might just hold off for the time being. Wrong. Pick one. And if it goes to zero, that's still better than being on the fence. Final example. Let's say the UK is at war with Germany. Let's call it World War II. And even though I was born in Germany, I was hoping to stay out of it because things are getting pretty weird around here. <sighs> Guess I gotta side with my people no matter what. Thanks, stranger. That advice really held up. Also, she called him Little Light again, despite him saying, please don't call me that. If HR doesn't do something soon, there is gonna be a no tap twit longer posted online titled, My Experience with the Stranger. For some reason, Peter D. Monotone really doesn't wanna visit the Awoken. How do we find the Awoken? They live all the way out at the edge of the darkness. Last place the light touches. Can't we just stay here with the murderous robots? You'll notice the in-game subtitles included an exclamation mark at the end of that sentence. If the script he read at the time included that little detail and he still gave it a one out of 10 effort, voice acting as we know it is over. Anyway, the disrespect continues. No, little light. Don't do that. Ooh, now HR needs to speak to us too. It's probably fine. We're the good guys. And welcome to the reef, where everything is purple and nothing is alive. This is right on the boundary where the traveler's light ends and the unyielding darkness begins. Remember the big FU ships off in the distance of the Cosmodrome? Those rockets were the last of humanity trying to flee Earth during the collapse. Everyone who did escape died right here. Ew. The people who live here are called the Awoken. Basically humans, but sexier and younger. On approach to their purple place of residence, we are escorted by some cranky ships. State your business or be fired on by order of the queen. Don't look at me. Better say something. We are from Earth. We're here to seek the counsel of the Awoken. Conform to my trajectory. Any deviation will be taken as an act of aggression. Looks like we're in the right place. Why is the right place always so terrifying? Joke writing is one of the hardest things in the world. And I specialize in jokes that don't land. However, what's with the buddy cop Marvel tone that's creeping in? The vibe has been so serious and bland this whole time. And then every now and then there's these weak, lukewarm little wisecracks from characters who haven't made a joke in their entire life. The tone of the story is just so weird sometimes. And it was really hard trying to articulate why it felt so cringe. And I don't think I've done a good job, but it just, it just is personally. But speaking of Marvel, this is interesting. By the time Death Destiny came out, we had three Iron Mans, two Thors, two Captain Americas, the Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, and a Partridge in a Pear Tree. I'm not saying they copied the serious moment, lighthearted joke, serious moment, lighthearted joke format, but also don't make me suck my own dick. I just find it fascinating to measure things by how many Marvel films had come out. So when I saw all of these, I was like, well, if it isn't me, suck in my own dick. And now I'd like you to meet the Half-Blood Prince himself, Aldrin. And his Yes Queen sister, Mara. She is here on the hot crazy scale. And this is me dressed as Aldrin and my friend Dado dressed as Mara. Completely unrelated. Aldrin is a potions professor and a sassy little bitch who's constantly trying to bang his own sister. Bungie was pretty far ahead of that genre. Two fallen guards peep from behind the throne and we aren't used to that. We've only known the feral ones who constantly try to kill us. Mara says that these ones are hers. Just look at the way she sits though. That is strong, I'll step on your balls 
and you'll thank me for it energy. Then we're like, just tell us where the black garden is. And he's like, everyone knows where it is. And we're like, dude, please just help us. And he's like, why should we? And then the queen is like, let me whisper in your ear, my thirsty little step bro. And then he's like, ooh, I love that. And then eventually he's like, fine, bring us the head of a gate lord and we'll make you a key. And we're like, okay, but why do you need it? And he's like, we don't need it. This is a test and you'll probably die. Good luck. But one does not simply find a gate lord. That's a large boy. We gotta go rip the brain out of a medium boy and see what's up. The Cyclops will do just fine. We grab his balls and taint and head to a nearby research facility. Ghost comments that these ruins predate humanity by a few billion years. You know what else predates humanity by a few billion years? The announcement of Elder Scrolls 6. You can never be too early with the first teaser trailer, am I right, Todd? The logo reveal is five years old, and that's all we have so far. Corporations were a mistake. So the research station was built by Dharma Initiative during the Golden Age to study Venus and your anus. These guys were the first human colony on this planet. They eventually built the library from earlier and maybe the entire city? Consult your local doctor. I'm literally guessing. Ghost hacks the local terminal and we learn that the Vex share one mind across a million units. Just like everyone on Reddit or Twitter or Facebook. IDK, but I definitely think for myself. It turns out that each Vex is part of a giant network. And if we can hack their system, the Gate Lord will be like, guys, not cool who did this, and that's when we pounce. There's two more Venus missions before we face a Gate Lord, the Archive and Scourge of Winter, but neither of them have any direct relevance to our current objective. We already know where the Gate Lord is, and we can launch that mission right now. If I was a cynical man, I'd say that this might contribute to a campaign feeling bloated and unfocused. We're just gonna skip those and go straight to the eye of a Gate Lord. As we fly in, Ghost tells us a bit more about the Vex. During the collapse, they transformed the planet Mercury into a machine in days. They would have spread to every planet if the Traveler hadn't stopped them. To lure out the G-Lord, we had to piss off the Vex like an angry beehive. Hacking their network and just generally being annoying seemed to do the trick. Pushing forward, eventually we make it to the Endless Steps, which is a big name for what in reality is a few steps and a grassy hill. I guess we have to step inside the ring, huh? That was clever. And as a fellow clever man, I like that. Out of the giant Vex labia comes the level 11 warrior effect monster, Gate Guardian. You can't tell me they didn't just say, make this guy, but skinny. Yu-Gi-Oh! Season 1 was peak anime and culture. We defeat Zydron, which destroys the big Clitoris, and we're off to get our key. It is alive. And still has its ball. That is a better roast than anything I could write personally. And the queen is easily my favorite character of this entire game so far. She's got minimal dialogue, but well-written lines, hot girl summer, interesting and believable character traits that are congruent with what she's saying, and most important, she isn't cringe. We flop the giant gate lord head at their feet like it's an eight inch monster hog. And the queen is like, well done, I like that hog. We will give you the key now. Aldrin is like, wow, just kill them right now if you're gonna actually send them to the black garden. And Queenie goes, Often when we guess at others' motives, we reveal only our own. If you've been starved for good dialogue all game, as we have, when you hear a line like that, it's an oasis in the desert. It stands out like the one guy wearing deodorant at a gaming convention. The key, it turns out, is just the glowing red eye part, so probably should have guessed that ourselves. Aldi gives us some coordinates on Mars, and the cue says this. I have shown you benevolence, Guardian. Should the Awoken ever need an ally, I will call on you and expect you to answer. She's saying you owe us, Guardian. Yeah, obviously she just said that, you titty milk sucking unemployed garage band little goblin. Welcome to the city of Dune, where Timothy Champagne LeMay is more attractive than most models I've seen. Keep up the great work, Tim. The gate to the Black Garden is somewhere on this planet, and right now we, are somewhere else. The Cabal occupy all the places and no one gets through their exclusion zone. Except we are literally here. So how secure is it actually? Crumbling city in the distance? Sick. Giant floating rock in the skybox? Sick. My tummy after I eat gluten? Also sick. We head to a nearby bunker, completely unimpeded, and Ghost fails his auto hack out of sheer arrogance. This was a trap. What can we possibly do against the overwhelming military force of nine red bar turtles and their dead? Over the hill, it appears the Vex are also at war with the cabal. No one gets through their exclusion zone is looking pretty incorrect. Fart sound, fart sound, fart sound. If you're gonna describe a thing, make it accurate to that thing. We find a rando commander and yoink his access key. What's this key for? Locked stuff? Yeah! 
Anyway, here's the gate we've been looking for, and it's a chonky piece of meat. Everyone knows big stuff is big cool. Look at these two worms, for example. One is a vegan's breakfast, and one is the coolest sci-fi animal of the decade. Ghost jacks into a Cabal laptop and drops this absolute knowledge bomb. Looks like we're going to have to go through the Cabal. Wow, I'm shocked, and doing Adderall off camera. So here's where we're at. The Gate Lord's eye is currently off, and we need it to be on to get into the Black Garden. The Space Turtles have a Vex power point that we can plug the eye into. Unfortunately, it's in the middle of a war base. So what are we going to do? Walk straight in? Oh yeah, we walk straight in. I think they think a surprise ambush is the ultimate checkmate move. But as someone who's never played chess, checkmate. I have diarrhea. Naturally, we kill everything and progress further into the base. Rather than staying behind cover, they keep yeeting straight to the front line to be murdered instantly. For a military-obsessed race, their tactics are pretty soft on the old erectometer. And as someone with low testosterone, I specialize in soft warfare. We make it to the power point and plug in the eye. USB-C, which is always a good time. While it's charging, the Cabal are pretty giga mad, so they keep sending gamers after us, including this guy, Primey Peacock, and the Feathers of Doom. His secret weakness is being shot repeatedly in the face. So lucky that's our main thing that we do. When he dies, the eye is charged. So return your seats to their upright position and stop eating custard, Jerry. It's nine o'clock in the morning. The next campaign mission, Buried City, is another weird one that's not really relevant to our current objective of Black Garden bad, save the universe, good. It's basically just go investigate the city on Mars and see what you find. And what we do find is a computer controlled by Putin from the earlier missions. This is more of a side tangent to the main plot, so I wish it was only unlocked after the big boy campaign was actually finished. Having it here is a little unfocused and the non-linear storytelling approach was a mistake that Bungie never tried again. Have I touched on the non-linear approach at all? Basically the original vision for D1's campaign was let's let them choose their own adventure. And so at all times, there's like two or three different missions available that you could do. It's not just like do this, now do this, now do this. As a result, you get these weird branching paths where there's supposed to be a lot of tension in this area, but then there's all this weird, not relevant at all filler stuff in another area, but you can do it all at the same. It's just, it's it's messy, it doesn't work, it lowers the stakes, IMO, not good. But he agrees, because they never went non-linear again. The Vex are taking control of the surface to protect the Black Garden. Mars could soon be worse than Venus. We've got to find out where they're coming from. Uh-oh, the Vexy Beehive know we're after the Black Garden on Mars. And they're cranky about that. In a train station under the city, we discover a bunch of portals they're using to flood the planet with Vex. I mean, you've seen Avengers Endgame. When one army can teleport in all the troops, that's annoying. And stop doing that. After we shut down the gates, though, it's plot twist time. This isn't an invasion. The Vex are returning home. Something is calling them back to the Black Garden. Could Peter Dink be any less interested in what he's saying? Not even a morsel of surprise in his tone of voice. Just by reading the words on paper, you can tell this was supposed to be a surprise bitch moment. I actually have a homegrown local organic conspiracy theory about the post-processing on Peter's voice. Have you ever wondered why there's such heavy auto-tune vocoder effects, plus all those digital analog hissing and whirring sounds whenever he talks? I always found it slightly annoying and I was like, oh, why have they overdone this? If you go back and watch footage from the Destiny Alpha test, his voice wasn't like that. Listen to this. Dead end. Fallen sealed this gate. I can get it open. Borderline regular human voice, scientists agree. Before you leave a comment saying, maybe they just hadn't finished the audio yet, Jez, don't bother. Because I watched a bunch of alpha footage and every other sound was identical to the retail release game. Every guardian sound, NPC sound, gun sound, enemy sound, ambient sound, UI sound, and song sound, aka music, was exactly the same. What are the chances they finished every sound in the game except the ghost voice when he's essentially the main character? Zero. Here's an example from the alpha. Watch what happens when the ghost goes from talking in our helmet. I mean, I think he's in our helmet. I don't actually know where he goes when he's not in his physical form around us. The point is, he's in our head or something. And then when we pull him out physically in front of us, listen to the change. Thousands of humans boarding the colony ships, off to build cities beyond. And now the fallen. He goes from very light digital voice to medium digital voice at most. It was a stylistic choice at the time, but here's what happened. The Destiny First Look Alpha limited test goes live in June for five days. What was the most heavily criticized part of the game? Dinkle Dork's deadbeat voice acting. And Bungie was very sensitive to the criticism because they had a minimum Metacritic score payment bonus threshold, where if the review scores were high enough, they'd get a bunch of extra money. So they were paying attention to what critics were saying. One line in particular, went viral for all the wrong reasons. The Hive haven't been on Earth in centuries. 
That wizard came from the moon. Ben from Polygon described it quite well back then. That line has become legendary among the players of the Alpha and it never failed to stop me dead in my tracks during my time playing the game. The line is so goofy and played with such a lack of emotion or context that it just sucks the enjoyment right out of the experience. It's like going on an amazing ride at Disneyland but the normally exciting music has been replaced by a bored man making armpit farts. Doesn't it just seem like Peter Pan turned up for work and said, give me that euthanasia and let me crank out some voice lines for the gamers. After the alpha, Bungie cut the cringe wizard line from the next beta, but sold a shirt leaning into the meme and it worked because within one hour, it was the best selling item on the Bungie store. One month after the alpha, the public beta goes live and now our ghost sounds like this. It worked. You're alive. You don't know how long I've been looking for you. I'm a ghost. Actually, now I'm your ghost. Heavy digitization the whole time. I think the word of the Lord came down from Bungie Upper Management and they said, what are we doing about Peter's voice? Let's effing crank the post-processing as high as it goes. We need that high Metacritic score. Then Peter was either too expensive or too busy to re-record any of his lines because at that time, Game of Thrones season five uh, had begun filming. So at release, we were still stuck with the monotone delivery, just with the heavy post-processing. If you needed more proof, it was never going to work with Dinka Dot. One year after launch, Bungie recast the ghost to Nola North and completely erased Peter's voice from the game. This might be a weird take, but I think Peter actually has a better voice than Nola North, but his delivery was so 0 out of 10. I do prefer the re-record, even though it can be a bit cartoonish. Shortly after the alpha's conclusion in a blog post, Bungie said this. Question. The ghost dialogue in the alpha was totally final, right? Answer. The ghost dialogue has already been updated for the beta. I found that article right at the end of my research, so it looks like I'm right about everything, as I usually am. All of this was a pointless tangent, but it's interesting to think that in a world where Peter gave a good performance from day one, our ghost would have sounded 90% regular human instead of 90% Bluetooth speaker. They eventually brought Peter back saying that one cringe line as like a rare Easter egg, but he coughs and turns back into Nola North, but that is a footnote at best. That wizard came from the moon. <coughs> from the moon? came from the moon. Back to the final mission, let's stay focused. I don't think we'll get a second chance at this. We pull this off, we can save the Traveler. If not, the Vex will seize our worlds. Wow, dude, what the? Where did these stakes come from? The Traveler hasn't even been properly mentioned since the end of the moon stuff. That was mission nine. We're now on mission 20. You can't just wait until we're loading in to the final mission and go, by the way, the Traveler's irrelevant again and our universe hangs in the balance on this one mission. Good luck. It's like the writers literally forgot there needed to be tension and stakes. And then one of them was like, wait, is the Traveler still part of this? And they were like, oh my God, the Traveler's part of this. Let's bring it back in, back to the Giga door. And now that we have a fully charged key, it's not a prob. We teleport to somewhere outside of known space and time. There's a bunch of statue vex like we're in Narnia and it's the White Witch's courtyard. And naturally, some of them are alive because I said so. There's something extremely dark down below. I think we found the Black Garden's heart. Three years later, Breath of the Wild copied this exact moment, but said, what if all this was the game? There's something about a glorious skybox that makes my brain shed happy chemicals all over itself. A million vex later, we come to the final gate. All we need is permission to enter it as a gate lord. It finally clicks for me that gate lord means protector of the gate, like the gate we're about to go through, except we're more like gate sword because... You get it. The White Tower of Light turns into this ornate tablet, which looks suspiciously similar to the opaque cards from Season of the Witch nine years later. Just an interesting connection. I am but a tour guide of the Destiny universe. And coming up on the left is Jim Carrey's house. What is this blue tablet though for real? It's completely unlike anything else in the game. Whatever, the eye pops out and it fractures into a vague constellation prism, which then unlocks the door. Hey, if you don't get it, that's on you. The heart of the Black Garden. Nothing. Or everything. Don't get cute with it, Ghost. This tension isn't even real. At least Nolan North gives us a more dynamic delivery in the redub. Well, here goes nothing. Or everything. The coronary artery disease heart of the Black Garden at last. This is your heart. 
and this is your heart while vaping. Say no to e-cigs. Whoever decided that machine worship should be a basic T-pose gets a raise immediately by order of the court. They do seem pretty mad though. Flubber squirts some magical space dust onto the Minotaur statue in the middle, but after the cutscene, clearly it's had no effect. Continuity is hard and everyone shoots blanks sometimes. A few minutes later, it tries again with the left statue and this time a child is conceived. It's evil Minotaur number one, who fires purple bullets and we kill with no problem, followed by evil Minotaur number two, who fires purple bullets and we kill him with no problem. Minotaur three will be different, I tell myself, as he fires purple bullets and we kill him with no problem. We'll come back to these guys in a sec. For now, I'm pretty sure the heart just had a heart attack and does a big splod. Technically, I'm not a doctor, but people have accused me of being one based on my sheer anatomical horsepower. For example, Arm. Anyway, the heart disappears and the evil vomity color grade is gone. And we're back to peaceful baby blue. That's how you know good guy make victory royale. Back to the three minotaurs. Um, yeah, so that was pretty anticlimactic, huh? Dark Souls 2 came out the same year and it had dragons the size of buildings yeeting around, wrecking environments and carpet bombing my entire family. I know it's a different genre of game to Destiny, but I believe my point is well made. It's a little disappointing to fight three copy pasta enemies that are so regular. We've seen them out in free roam like 20 times before now. What might surprise you is that the three big boys are all slightly different if you zoom in, brighten the colors, upscale to 4K and stand still. We actually have the grassy one, the donut one and the antlers one. Never mind the fact that if there's any action at all, the differences are imperceptible. Bungie did try a little. Yes, the differences are purely cosmetic and the movement sounds and weapons are all identical. I do legally have to acknowledge they tried. The names are kind of a whole thing too though because the antlers one is called called Primeval Mind, which means past. The Donut one is called Imminent Mind, which means present. And the Grassy one is called Eschaton Mind, which means touch my penis. No, it means future. Well, it technically means the end of the world, but English is a drunk magician that does whatever it wants. And also make it a K and stop playing games with me. Eschaton, Eschaton. I checked Google Translate, it's Eschaton. <sighs> Suck my dick, Jez, you dropped out of school and everyone knows you're a dumb piece of shit. Eschaton. So there's actually kind of a cool past, present and future thing going on with these minotaurs. And we know from earlier that this area is outside of space and time, but it's in name only. The ghost doesn't say anything about it. The gameplay doesn't reflect it literally at all. What's crazy is that somewhere else in the game, they did use this exact concept in the gameplay. The Vault of Glass raid came out one week after the base game. In that raid, there's a section where you get randomly teleported into either the past or the future version of the same spot. Ruined and ancient or reclaimed by nature. It's a sweet concept. And it was right here in the base game and they only put it in the raid. Why? Vault of Glass came out and was only completed by a tiny percentage of hardcore players, given it's a non-match made six man activity. If Bungie was saving the future past aesthetic for that moment, the vast majority of players missed it. And the raid was already special. It didn't need any extra help. But the campaign was like getting tased in the dick repeatedly. It really could could have used some time heist shenanigans. Also, the future past timey-wimey storytelling isn't explicitly explained in the raid, whereas if they'd folded that concept into the main campaign, it could have been fleshed out way more. Yes, multiversal time travel is obviously pretty overdone in current year, but back in 2014, that would have been a Rotten Tomatoes 100% fresh mega banger. The final thing that annoyed me about the Minotaurs is the order you fight them. It's grass first, then donut, then antler. And based on the names, that's future, present, past. Except everyone knows the saying is past, present, future. Why not go chronological? Ooh, there's no reason for this to annoy me at all, but it does. Please pray for me. It's past, present, future. Okay, back to the story. We just killed the heart. Ghost tells us that light returns to the traveler. The speaker is calling us home. We haven't actually talked to the speaker since literally mission two. That was 18 missions ago. Feels pretty transactional now that we've saved the world. He's like, oh my God, um, we, we should totally catch up. Guardian, you, effing hell, you, you did it. You and I, let's come hang out with me. Or it's because Bill Nye was too expensive and they could only afford him for like two cutscenes. For centuries, we feared the forces of darkness massing against us. We sought to hide and cower beneath a broken god. No more. So the capital T Trav has been restored to full health, except visually it looks the same. Uh, it's still cracked underneath and nothing else has changed. This dinky egg was such a prominent part of Destiny 1's marketing. In the campaign, we're told it's sick and broken, except what does that actually mean? And then at the very end, we're told it's fixed and it's healthy, but what does that actually mean? The space globe is a fascinating sci-fi mystery that they refuse to elaborate on in a story that's completely underpinned by said space globe. You put a cool thing in the thing, 
So talk about that cool thing. How hard is it? Meanwhile, the stranger is hanging out by the ships and she offers us her rifle as a little gift. In a loot game, it always feels good to get more loot per loot. Put it straight up me bum. Then she says, effing hell, keep playing this game. The campaign is over, but there's, there's more bad guys. Please don't go back to Call of Duty. That's a direct quote. And then we fly off into the distance and it's roll credits. Looking back at the main characters of this story, what did we actually learn? The ghost, uh, he wakes us up and unlocks doors. The speaker, he only talks to you if you save the world. The stranger, she thinks being evil is better than being neutral. Stop that. Get some help. Also, you did have time to explain every time you didn't explain. Aldrin, sexually frustrated. The queen, bad bitch. Stole every scene she was in. The Traveler, silent, helpless, and works part-time at McDonald's. Um, actually, little known fact. I just don't feel like I really know anyone, except maybe the ghost. But he was so painful to listen to, I I've completely blacked it out and have taken up excessive drinking to cope. It's crazy looking back at this iconic Destiny screen after finishing the campaign, because we don't know what the logo is, we don't really know what the Traveler is, and we don't even really know what's happening on Earth broadly. We saw a tiny slice of one country and had a teaser view of one city, and then we just went elsewhere. I don't know, dude. Walking away from that vanilla camp campaign just not feeling good about the time spent. Obviously, The Taken King came out one year later, did a really good job telling a linear story, but that's a whole nother video. IGN gave Vanilla Destiny a 7.8 out of 10 at the time, and GameSpot a 6 out of 10. If you thought English was tricky, wait until you meet my friend from work, emotionally charged, subjective number values. Scrolling through D1's Google reviews was an insane cesspool that I couldn't look away from. I read all 338. I love this game a lot, but at the end of the day, what they promised us was not delivered. 5 out of 5 stars, very positive. First October showed us Bungie is one of the biggest liar and disrespectful brand in the game area. After five years, I hate to refund latest DLS, and above it, I had to uninstall the game. I'm realty sick and tired about whole problems, and the main reason of those came from Bungie's laxity and disrespect about their community all the time. We used to just enjoy, not angry, damn. What happened on the 1st of October? This guy is referencing it like it's gaming's 9-11 and everyone knows what happened, and I don't think you can refund DLC after five years, sorry, DLS. Otherwise, boy, do I have a scheme for you. Love the game. However, Arsenal of Oddities is pure stupidity. In my opinion, you shouldn't put V-Hard Parkour in a non-plat former game. FYI, me and my friend have been trying this for about four to five hours now. Yeah, Arsenal of Oddities is a Destiny 2 quest. He's they're playing Destiny 2. Pause the exotic mission, Greg. I'm leaving a Google review. The real reason why Bungie and Microsoft split off from Activision because Bungie wanted to start doing their own business and that is why they made this game. Plus they were wrong about this game that they said it's a RPG game, but it's not and this game had bad reviews. I don't if Bungie could make a good game without Microsoft, except that 343 owns Halo. If it's not gonna work out for Bungie to try making a good game, then they get a lot of problems. They can't get any money if they're gonna say that their games, it's a RPG game. And by the way, I'm big fan of Halo and not Destiny. They're gonna be losing a lot of money if they don't bring back Halo. The amount of incorrect facts and pure guesswork stated as objective reality kind of tickled my gooch here. I rate this one an Elon Musk out of 10. I love her channel so much for channel is the best thing I ever seen. So yeah, I'll go subscribe to her, give them light and subscribe because it said best thing ever ever seen is the best thing you ever see. You would never let anything that you needed. This is the best thing I see. I see it all the time. Had and she is the best thing I ever known because she is my friend. I don't care cost to fly to her because she is the best. Don't play with her. She is the best. This was actually Destiny giving five stars to that girl from NPC TikTok. No, but that really was an actual review under Destiny 1. And it can't just be a bot, right? Because it's too incoherent. No functioning bot could actually generate something so low quality. I'm sure of it. It doesn't even mention a channel by name or link anything. So if it was a bot promotion service from Thailand, what was it promoting? How can they love her kennel so much, but not tell me which kennel? I don't care cost to fly to her. Is it like a premium escort thing? Don't play with her. She is the best. Well, do you recommend her or not? I love it so much. I fall to sleep every night, her head in my lap. Sometimes my neck hurts, but I love this game. Thanks you for four them up to play. Who is she? Sleep every night, head in my lap. It feels like I'm reciting Shakespeare as I try and read these reviews word for word. Technically it's English, but it's so out of this time. You know what I mean? What is going on here, Sean? In a hundred years, aliens will study the sentence, thanks you for for them up to play and conclude that humanity was not sentient. The game is pretty fun to play and hop in with my friends, but the whole reason I got the game was to play in an open world and fly my ship. Very disappointed in not being able to hop into my ship and fly around. Kinda am hoping for a Destiny 3 that has it. Three stars. A lot of focus on the lack of ship flying from Vincent. No Man's Sky had been out for four years when he wrote this review. Vincent, wherever you are out there, I hope you're enjoying Star Field because it's everything you've ever wanted. I grew up playing games like this one, and this just put the icing on the cake of my childhood. 11 out of 10 game, very much enjoyed. One out of five stars. It can be hard to decode the, the five golden star rating system overall. Those, 
Any number of stars could mean anything. Worst game ever. My friend recommended this game, and so I watched of it, and I was sleeping during the video. And so I looked at the most popular Destiny video, and it was still trash. So watching Destiny videos should be just as interesting as playing it yourself. That's like saying watching golf is boring, therefore playing it is also boring, even though I've never played. Don't get me wrong, golf is boring. But those are two different things, Makoska, and you know it. For the most popular Destiny video, if you search Destiny 1 and sort by view count on YouTube, you get a Destiny rap with 20 million views. That's completely in Spanish. Maybe he thinks uh, it's a Spanish karaoke game and maybe it is. Okay, these next two reviews were back to back while scrolling. I usually don't like to spread negativity, but I felt that all of these good reviews were misleading. The game is mediocre at best. I've been playing it for like five years. The PvP is clunky and laggy. The PvE is repetitive and boring. And the story is the worst story I've ever played. My favorite game for five years straight. 10 out of 10, two gamers. Five years of playtime, mediocre at best, and 10 out of 10. People are tricky, aren't they? By the way, 3,000 hours that were mediocre at best is also the name of my Destiny 2 review. It is good, Uwu. Follow the off-brands on TikTok. I am one of them. Uwu, we are not furries. Oh, whoa. This is what happens when TikTokers find the rest of the internet. The we are not furries kind of comes out of nowhere at the end and makes me think that maybe they are furries. Like if I said to you, subscribe to this channel for more green screen rants, and I don't jerk off to feet pics. Like, I think we all know. Also, I tried to search off brands on TikTok and approximately 1 million channels came up that all looked the same. If you're gonna do a self promotion be a little bit more specific, Darren. I prefer Destiny 3. The graphics are far superior in every way. Nice try, liberals. I am God. Not only am I God, I am God. Nice try, liberals, followed by I am God is a level of comedic genius I can only aspire to. And I don't even know what liberals are. Bad, really bad. My son played this game, horrible. I might sue y'all. He had a mental problems. If this isn't an allegorical haiku about parenthood in an overly litigious society and the ongoing mental health crisis, then I don't know what is. Or her son got mad playing Destiny and she thinks that's Bungie's fault. Thank you, Fader. Two people found this helpful. Destiny is a ripoff of Warframe. Play a better and free game. Warframe technically did come out over a year before Destiny, so this looks like an FBI open up slam dunk case to me. Guys in space shooting aliens. Pretty obvious, Bungie. You didn't even try to hide it. Not fun. El Stinko L. Stinko L. Stinko L. Stinko. It's the long mental pause before spamming El Stinko that really got me. As you can see, we are descending towards your average terminally online internet child with these last few. By the way, what is El Stinko? Is it like a Twitch emote? I tried looking it up. Somebody tell me in the comments, please. I'm effing 30 years old. What is El Stinko? Pay to win. Blah, blah, blah. Abulge blah. The typo and the formatting really elevate this piece for me. I think by pay to win, they actually mean I'm angry this game and all its DLCs aren't completely free. Abulge. Also, I'm 11 years old and mummy won't give me her credit card details. Garbage game, but I never played it. My friend says it's good though. Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. I hate to be elitist, but should we let anyone with the internet also have a keyboard? To start with a lowercase g and a lowercase i, then capitalize the m, no apostrophe it's, T-H-O spelling with no period full stop. Baffling, but it continues. A line break with 13 spacebar inputs before the question marks. I mean, it's all so specific and wonderful. You couldn't get ChatGPT to auto-generate something this odd? If I gave you a million dollars, but you could, subscribe right now for more I think green screen rants, dude. I made another one exactly like this for Cyberpunk's campaign, and that is on screen right now. I spent about nine months and thousands of dollars paying my editor to help me make it a 23-minute absolute mega banger. We worked so hard on it. I think it's so good. It's, it's on screen right now. Go on. You can do it. Please watch it. 